This is Addiction Medicine Journal Club. I'm Dr. Sonia Del Tredici. And I'm Dr. John Keenan. We believe that addiction is a disease that can be treated, and we want to help you stay up to date with the latest research that you can use in your addiction medicine practice. This episode is for all you busy docs, PAs, and NPs out there. We have for you quick summaries of our 10 most recent articles. John, how are you tonight? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm ready for this episode. Yeah, me too. I'm totally ready. You want to just get us started? Sure. So episode 31, Injection Drug Use Frequency Before and After Take-Home Naloxone Training. So this study comes from the Supermex cohort. So it's 1,328 participants who inject drugs were recruited between 2008 to 2010 and 2017 to present. Participants underwent annual follow-up, including in-depth face-to-face or telephone interviews. They gathered information regarding adverse health outcomes, cessation, relapse patterns, and impact on health services. This particular component was a longitudinal cohort study comparing risk behaviors in 189 participants from that supermix cohort in the Melbourne Injecting Drug Users Cohort Study. And that was before and after take-home naloxone training. So that was kind of the intervention here. The primary outcome was injection drug frequency. The secondary outcome was opioid injecting frequency, use of drugs alone, benzodiazepine use frequency, so other surrogate markers of high risk for overdose. I really like this study because it's a non-industry funded longitudinal study, basically has a large cohort base. Um, Limitations would be that it's not blinded. um, And the statistical analysis, even though the cohort was very large at 1,328, in terms of this intervention, it was only 189 of those participants. So it's about 14.2%. So a very small subset. Results of the study kind of pre and post take-home naloxone training it really made no difference. So I think the big area of concern here is that if you do take home naloxone training, are you kind of advocating for, or are you kind of making it more likely that someone's going to inject drugs? And they had no statistically uh, significant association between opioid use frequency, use of opioids alone, and benzodiazepine use frequency. And actually there was a non-statistically significant reduction in injection frequency. So kind of a trend towards that. So I think all in all, this is probably you know, harm reduction uh, technique, definitely, but not something that's going to increase risk, truly just harm reduction. Well, and I think it's really good because there is still an attitude, especially among people who don't work in addiction medicine, that if you make drug use easier or safer, people are going to want to use more drugs. And that is the case in some situations. If you make a risky behavior safer, people will do more of that, but it doesn't usually work that way. And it certainly doesn't work that way with drug use. So this study just kind of spoke to that. So I don't think it'll change what I do, but it's nice to be able to tell people out in the community, look, giving out naloxone is not going to make people use more drugs. Yeah, although I I will say I'm I'm optimistic about kind of how this has changed, right? I think we've covered another article before where they talked about perceptions and in terms of recovery model and many people that were kind of non-related to the field of addiction medicine, they were kind of supportive of a lot of these harm reduction campaigns, a lot more so than I think previously had been noted. So there's a shift. Yeah, the message has gotten across somewhat. Well, that was a good article. You ready for number 32? Yeah. All right. This article was called Trazodone for Sleep Disturbance in Opioid-Dependent Patients Maintained on Buprenorphine, and it was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. A little bit of background is that sleep disturbance is common among people with opioid use disorder, both with and without buprenorphine treatment, and sleep quality is a very important predictor of relapse. But there's been very little research on trazodone for sleep disturbance in this group of patients, even though it's a medicine that's used very commonly in this situation. The objective of this paper was to assess the effect of trazodone on sleep disturbances among patients with opioid use disorder who are on buprenorphine and compare it to placebo. So real simple, classic randomized controlled trial, trazodone versus placebo to treat sleep disturbances in people on buprenorphine. They included 100 middle-aged Indian men who were all stable on long-term buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, and they all had sleep disturbance, and they defined that as a PSQI, which is the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, greater than five. They excluded patients who had any other condition that might impair sleep, which included pretty much all mental and physical health problems. So it was a pretty narrowly focused group of people, so people who really just had sleep disturbance and nothing else and no other secondary cause. They got trazodone or placebo for six weeks, and subjective sleep quality was measured using a whole bunch of different sleep questionnaires. So we thought this was a valid trial. 
But we thought the study population was a little too limited because neither of us can think of any patients we have with insomnia who have no other mental or physical problems. So we're not totally sure that we would see these patients in our own practice. It's just, it's just, it's, it was too narrowly defined. So that was a limitation. But overall, I thought the study was well designed. The results in a nutshell say that trazodone is well tolerated and effective in improving sleep disturbance in individuals with opioid dependence who are on buprenorphine over a six-week period. It really did work. It improved sleep in 82.4% of participants compared to improved sleep in 17.6% with placebo. The number needed to treat to get your PSQ score from above five to less than five, so from poor sleep to adequate sleep, was 1.5. So you needed to treat one and a half people, which I thought was pretty good. So treating one to two people with trazodone to improve one person's sleep. They also had good data on the adverse effects of trazodone. So 41% had dry mouth, 22% had headache, and 20% had morning drowsiness, which was useful for me. So in summary, I already use trazodone as one of my go-to medications for sleep disturbance in patients with opioid use disorder. And this study gave me even more data to support my current practice. However, the population was somewhat limited, so I'm not sure it will work quite as well in a group who had a more complex insomnia with other mental or physical health diagnoses. Yeah, I think the fact that it was like kind of such a limited criteria, though, for who they were applying this to, I think it teases out to just the effect of the medication, right? I think it would be useful to see a study where we actually did that in patients with concordant mental health disorders, but I think that you can kind of insinuate at least the start of this that it is an effective medication for patients with opioid use disorder and insomnia. Yeah, and it doesn't say it doesn't work in that other population, just that it really works well in people with this pure insomnia without any other cause. Episode number 33, this is one of my favorite ones, uh, non-fatal overdose risk associated with prescribing opioid agonists concurrently with other medications, a cohort study conducted using linked primary care, secondary care, and mortality records. So this was a retrospective cohort study utilizing anonymized longitudinal electronic health records from the general practices and the clinical practice research data link, the CPRD, which was 20,898 patients with methadone or buprenorphine between January 1st, 1998 and December 31st, 2017. And they actually linked these outpatient records to hospital episode statistics admitted patients. That's called the HES APC database and the neighborhood and practice level index of multiple deprivations, quintiles, and mortality data from the office for national statistics, the ONS. So this is basically a UK trial, really good data kind of linking care in different settings. I really like that just a little background, the CPRD has previously been validated that it kind of broadly represents the UK population as a whole. So you can kind of extrapolate that it kind of has a good census and cross section. So population could be transferred to anywhere in the UK. Basically, it was adults age 18 and above on methadone and buprenorphine. And basically, they would end the study period if they switched to another OAT, they, which is an open agonist therapy. They went to another practice location or they died or there was a, a database entry for kind of a non-fatal overdose. Outcome of interest was non-fatal overdose, and that was basically via ICD-10 codes from the HES APC database. I really like that this was a large national database-derived cohort study, very large numbers, right? 20,898 is a pretty big sample. The fact that it was kind of linked to these national registries, I think that really validates the data collection. I mean, oftentimes if it wasn't coded, it, it didn't happen, but I do think the fact that these are nationally subsidized databases and maintained databases kind of speaks to their validity. Typical database limitations, though. I, I, I do this all the time. I think about every time we, we do one of these database articles, whenever our, the EMR reminds me that I need to consider additional HCC codes for every diagnosis, and I'm, I'm thinking about like what's being captured there. So results, uh, 21.6% of these participants experienced one or more non-fatal overdose. 54% had multiple uh, non-fatal overdoses. So there seemed to be a subset of patients that kind of account for a large number of these non-fatal overdoses. And uh, about 29% of overdoses occurred with co-prescription of one of these, quote, high-risk medications. And the high-risk medications that they classified for this were the gabapentinoids, antipsychotics, and Z-drugs, so our sleep medications, benzodiazepines, opioids, and antidepressants. So those are the drugs of interest that they studied. When you actually look, they calculate this weighted rate ratio. It's kind of like a relative risk of, of overdose per substance or per co-prescription of a high-risk medication. 
And I thought it was very interesting, kind of in order from the highest risk of co-prescription non-fatal overdose to lowest. Number one was gabapentinoids. Number two was antipsychotics. Three was Z drugs. Four was benzodiazepines. And five was co-prescription with opioids. There was no statistically significant increased uh, weighted rate ratio for overdose with antidepressants, which does make a lot of sense. And interestingly, there was no association between the uh, co-prescribed high-risk drug and whether or not your opioid agonist therapy was buprenorphine or methadone. So neither one conferred a higher risk, which I also thought was interesting. So I really like this um, study, I think, because it kind of flips upside down a lot of our preconceptions about the safety of uh, gabapentinoids, antipsychotics. I think many people feel comfortable prescribing those, but not benzodiazepines, which was lower down on the list. I haven't really changed my practice except for now. I kind of I've scrutinized my gabapentin prescriptions more than I used to, and I at least make sure there's an appropriate indication, although that's always difficult. People, I mean, there's many indications for gabapentin. I mean, there's an indication for chronic cough, right? So gabapentin is like uh, steroids, gabapentin, doxycycline. It's like the three drugs that seem to kind of infiltrate every treatment condition. Cure everything that ails you. No, I totally thought about this paper. In fact, today I'm trying to wrap up a visit and I'm running behind trying to get people through and... This patient says, oh, and by the way, can you refill my gabapentin and muscle relaxants? And and I was like, wait, what? And so then it was like gabapentin and muscle relaxants and buprenorphine together three times a day as like a poly dose. And this paper gave me pause. A sidebar, not to get off topic, but I feel like muscle relaxants are one. I, I kind of just almost can't believe we still make that medication. I've never seen any studies show that it statistically did anything, yet we prescribe them like for so many different conditions. I mean, maybe spastic quadriplegia, but not clearly as effective as probably its everyday use and a very common medication with high risk on people's med recs. Did they do muscle relaxants in that paper? They should have now that I'm thinking about it. We should have sent that letter. <laughs> maybe you can write the uh, authors and ask them to redo their study. The non-solicited opinions of us. <laughs> Un- unsolicited feedback from the internet on your work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you wrote this paper, just let uh, we want to let you know uh, we really liked it. I loved it, <laughs> even though you didn't include muscle relaxants. <laughs> um. All right. Episode thirty four was about a paper called buprenorphine dose and time to discontinuation among patients with opioid use disorder in the era of fentanyl, which is our era right now. So as we know, the illicit opioid supply is primarily made up of fentanyl and its analogs, which are highly addictive and deadly. There were about 73,000 fentanyl-related overdose deaths in 2022. And because fentanyl is such a potent opioid agonist, it may cause more opioid receptor downregulation than other less potent opioids. This downregulation then leads to more rapid tolerance. And also, because of the downregulated opioid receptors, patients who want to use buprenorphine may require higher doses to activate the remaining receptors. So many of us in practice are finding that new patients are not able to feel normal on 16 milligrams of buprenorphine, which was previously considered the maximum dose, and they require 24 milligrams or more even every day. So that's some background. So the clinical question in this paper was basically what dose works best to start people out on buprenorphine. So it looked at residents of Rhode Island who were initiating buprenorphine for opioid use disorder in the years 2016 to 2020, and they got their data from the Rhode Island PDMP, so pretty accurate data about prescriptions. Population was 61% male, mostly aged 25 to 44, 90% were insured, and the initial doses were mostly 8 milligrams, 16 milligrams, or 24 milligrams. So 21 patients got 8 milligrams for their first dose, or first sort of stable dose, 50% got 16 milligrams and 10% got 24 milligrams for their initial dose of buprenorphine. What it looked at was the daily dose of buprenorphine based on that initial prescription. And the outcome was time to treatment discontinuation in the six months after they started. So basically, how long do people go staying on their buprenorphine based on what their initial dose was or correlated with their initial dose? Overall, I thought the question was pretty good. They defined it well. The study did have some significant limitations, which is common in our retrospective cohort studies. So the biggest problem was that this data set, which is from the Rhode Island PDMP, covered a huge range of clinical facilities, patient demographics, types of clinicians. I mean, anybody who was prescribing buprenorphine in any setting was in this database. And so it makes it difficult to eliminate some of the confounding that may have led to one or other choice of dose and affected time and treatment. 
you can't just say that the patients who receive 24 milligrams as a starting dose were the same as those who received 16. And especially early on in this study, 2016, 2017, 24 milligrams is an unusual starting dose. So like do the patients who get that or the doctors who prescribe that, are they really representative of the population overall? So I thought that was a limitation, not the author's fault, but a limitation in the data. In terms of results, the primary outcome was percent of patients who had discontinued treatment by six months. So in the 16 milligram group, 59% had stopped treatment at six months. In the 24 milligram group, 53% had stopped treatment. And although the two groups may not have been similar at baseline, those who started on 24 milligrams of buprenorphine were somewhat more likely to be in treatment at six months. So that's the conclusion. The 24 milligrams starting dose of buprenorphine patients were more likely to be in treatment. 53% of them had stopped versus 59% in the 16 milligram group had stopped. They also looked at the 8 milligram group, but it was pretty much the same as the 16 milligram group in terms of percent who discontinued. So in conclusion, while the 24 milligrams of buprenorphine wasn't shown to be that much better than the 16 milligrams, it certainly wasn't worse and it was shown to be somewhat better. So I'll be very comfortable using those doses higher than 16 milligrams right out of the gate. And after reading this paper, I also you know, I've been moving away from this for the last year or two, not viewing those doses higher than 60 milligrams as somehow abnormal or a red flag for aberrant behavior. I just view them now as normal doses people might need. So I thought this was a good paper and I was really glad I got to dive into it a little bit. What did you think? Yeah, I like this paper because it kind of it kind of told me that I'm already doing is good, which is sometimes I like to hear that. But I feel like the doses over 16 milligrams the um, combination product versus the buprenorphine mono product. I feel like as I've done more of this and I have like hundreds of of people I treat a month at at this point, just like you do large panels of of patients, I've I've really relaxed a lot about kind of getting bent out of shape about doses over 20, over 16 to up to 24. If that is what works for someone and the same with like the combination versus the mono product, I just feel like if it works for the person, I'm, I'm kind of okay with working with them. You know, we got into trouble with controlled substances as primary care doctors, you know, prescribing based on subjective symptoms. We'd say like, oh, however much opioids people say they want is how much they should get. And that didn't work out so good. But buprenorphine is just so different. Once people reach the dose that works for them, they almost never change it. You know, I don't see dose escalation very frequently. I don't see tolerance. I don't see change in effect over time. You know, you don't see overdose. You have less overdoses rather than more when you're on buprenorphine. So it's so safe. So in some ways, it's like, we should be very comfortable letting patients just choose the dose that works for them and going with that one. Episode 35, removal of Medicaid prior authorization requirements and buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder. I was kind of excited to pick a policy article, although I think that this board, a lot of people, I'm sorry. It's, it's a retrospective state level serial cross-sectional study using quarterly data from 2015 to 2019 to compare buprenorphine prescriptions in states that did, did not remove Medicaid prior authorizations. Um, basically, the thought is that prior authorizations are the bane of a lot of primary care and most physicians day to day. Oftentimes, we're asked to kind of go through additional loopholes for treatments that are well validated, and it just kind of adds frustration and decreases a patient's chance of getting the medication that they that they so desperately need or treatment. So this analysis was limited to states with prior authorizations in place at the start of 2015, and that required fee-for-service and managed care organization plans to have similar prior authorization processes, and that we had at least two quarters of data out of a year. So basically what happened was that was 25 states had met that criteria, and they excluded two states. I got to give a shout out. I have family from Vermont and Vermont was excluded because they do such a good job with buprenorphine's prescriptions and a treating addiction. So not only do they have the best maple syrup in the world, but they are like leading the pack for kind of addiction treatment. So love to give a shout out to Vermont. Outcome of interest was data regarding prior authorization policy attained from the state registrars. So basically, they looked at kind of what was the prior authorization policy at the time, how that changed over time, and then looked at database about drug utilization for what the prescriptions were like for buprenorphine. So if was there an association with or without? They did a ton of covariate analysis looking at kind of baseline characteristics of states that 
that removed the authorization. It looked at things like number of docs or number of practitioners that had the X waiver. Um, this is kind of in that time frame. Uh, number of, of individuals receiving methadone, number receiving buprenorphine, people age 12 and above living uh, below the poverty line, the presence of a PDMP that was mandatory at the state level. It, it, it's kind of crazy to me that, you know, 2019, that, that there are still states that don't require the use of a, of a PDMP for prescribing controlled substances, but that's what it is. I really liked this study because it was uh, non-industry, non-politically funded by uh, Health Resources and Service Administration and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So it wasn't meant to be political. I'm sure that you can't remove that entirely. Uh, No industry funding, clearly. Um, They used a lot of kind of like validated databases for their uh, information that they obtained, basically Medicaid state drug utilization database, uh, CDC Wonder, SAMHSA, uh, the National Survey on Substance Abuse Treatment Services, the Census Bureau, and Kaiser Foundation were the primary sources of information. C- to kind of get ahead of it, the prior authorization removal had no effect. So there was no effect on prior authorization removal and kind of recruiting more practitioners to prescribe buprenorphine, which is very sad in my opinion. Things I did think that was interesting when they did all that covariate analysis that states that removed prior authorizations compared to those who maintain them, um, you know, they basically had more buprenorphine prescribers. They had a higher percentage of people living below the poverty line. They had a higher likelihood of expanded Medicaid. Um, they had more of these MCO plans um, and they had a higher amount of patients receiving methadone. So basically removal of prior authorization, not surprisingly, was associated with states that were addiction treatment friendly. And I hate to kind of distill to that, but that's kind of what it is. Um, I think that the, the the question that I'm left at the end of this article is like, at this point, like, what, what does it take to get like more people like in the game, right? I think of locally in our own organization that we did a big push to try to get all these prescribers. There was even kind of grants where people got money to kind of get their waiver when there was waivers in place. They got money to do this. And we haven't seen like a big uptick of, of prescribers either. And so I just don't know what it's going to take to get other people to, to treat this. Right. I think I was, you know, during the original recording, I was sadly unenthusiastic about this article, even though they did a great job and you did a great job presenting it. And it's the same. It's just depressing. It's like primary care complains. They won't do this because it's too annoying because of the prior auths. And then they remove the prior auths and like still nobody does it. So I, it just says that when there, where there's a will, there's a way. Like, you know, if you want to prescribe medicines for your patients, you do the prior auth. Like, is there any any medicine that you truly want to use that you refuse to use because of prior authorization requirements? I mean, if I want the patient to have it, I do the paperwork. You know, it's only when I actually don't even really want the patient to have the medicine or I don't even want to get into it that I push back on that. So I think it just, it goes back to sort of stigma and lack of will from people, you know, to prescribe buprenorphine. So that's why I was a little bit, I don't know, depressed about this article. You know, I would be interested to see in the next decade, I know internal medicine, family medicine has kind of integrated this as part of their ACGME curriculum as kind of a standard skill that everyone should have. I think that hopefully that will kind of make more people comfortable with it. I think that the DEA requirements, which almost kind of moving the X training into the standard DA re- uh, renewal process. I think hopefully that will make more people more comfortable. But I think until it's kind of an expectation that this is like a care that you provide your patients, just like treating depression or high cholesterol, I think that until it's considered something that is all primary care physicians are, are kind of expected to be able to do, I don't. I think we're not going to see that, right? The fact it's opt-in still is crazy to me. Right. And it's, you know, primary care is expected to do a lot of stuff that's not in our training and a lot of stuff that's high risk. Like, I really feel there's a strong expectation that primary care do all the prescribing of opioids for pain, benzodiazepines, and stimulants. Like, we've already been sort of required to take over all of that prescribing. And people just did it unquestioningly. Sure, I'll do that. No problem. Patient wants it. No problem. And we haven't, you know, people refuse to do that for buprenorphine. And some of it is the stigma and some of it was the requirements you know, but I, I hope I, I have hope for the future as well. I always tell the residents that now this last thing before we go on because I know we've got more articles, but I, I feel like people don't really realize what it is. I think they think it's, you know, most people have kind of experiences with patients with addiction when they're in the throes of addiction and it's like an adversarial relationship. Uh, something's going on either like, you know, misuse of their controlled substances or they're kind of acting out because they're withdrawing in the hospital. But this is really different, right? These people are working with you. You're kind of back in a care congruent manner where you're both on the same team. It feels like, actually, I feel like actually I, I 
I'm a better doc because I, I work with this group now and it makes me feel more optimistic about people. Well, that's awesome. Just keep sharing that with the residents and eventually everyone else will retire and they'll be in charge. This is ages. <laughs> All right. So anyway, episode 36 was about an article called Emotional Dysregulation Factors Associated with Problematic Smartphone Use Severity, The Mediating Role of Fear of Missing Out. And just like you experimented with presenting a policy article, I experimented with presenting an article on problematic smartphone use. Um, I was interested in the topic and this article came across my desk, so I thought I would try to present it to everybody. So a little bit of background. Globally, the rates of problematic smartphone use and problematic internet use, which is very similar, have been increasing, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. Internet gaming disorder made it into the DSM-5 as a diagnosis that needs further study. So it got legitimized that way. And problematic smartphone use, which is very similar, is a topic of great interest to a lot of people, both professionals and lay people. I remember when we recorded this, we both noted that you know, when we tell people we do addiction medicine, a lot of people in the community, like our friends or we'll be at a barbecue or something, all ask about smartphone addiction. So it's something people are really interested in. There's not an official definition of problematic smartphone use, although you could kind of extrapolate from the diagnostic criteria for internet gaming disorder. The potential negative consequences of smartphones have been assessed in various studies. And I read a really good meta-analysis that detailed what the various issues might be. Basically, it seems like different authors have linked smartphones to pretty much every negative consequence you could think of. So problems in self-control, emotional health, physical health, job performance, school performance, social problems. Basically, any problem that exists, people have studied whether smartphones make it worse. So this study looked at emotional dysregulation, which is defined as maladaptive reactions to your own emotions. And that has been linked to problematic smartphone use. And the authors think that it might be mediated through what we or they call FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. And FOMO is a big thing if you have teenagers. There's a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out. So what is the clinical question? So this study analyzed fear of missing out as a mediator in the association between emotional dysregulation and problematic smartphone use severity. So basically, is FOMO the reason that problematic smartphone use causes emotional dysregulation? It included undergraduate students in a U.S. Midwestern University psychology department research pool. So these are undergraduate college students. And they were basically measured their emotional dysregulation, which just to give a technical definition, it's defined as maladaptive ways of reacting to emotions, including struggles in understanding, accepting, and modulating emotions, regardless of their valence, intensity, or reactivity. So basically, you can't handle your own emotions. And then FOMO, fear of missing out, is a persistent concern that one is not present in the gratifying experiences of other people and is characterized by a need to stay connected to know what other people are doing. So that's what they looked at, those two things. And the outcome was online measures of emotional dysregulation, FOMO, and problematic smartphone use. And for each of those, there was like a scale. You could get a you know, number of points that determine the severity. And students filled them out using online surveys. So the authors had three hypotheses. One, they thought FOMO is positively linked to problematic smartphone use severity. Two, that emotional dysregulation is significantly and positively related to FOMO. And three, emotional dysregulation leads to FOMO, which then leads to problematic smartphone use severity. So that's the question. Sorry, I got a little wordy there, but this paper had a lot of information in it. Was it valid? I mean, I thought it was an okay trial. I did have concerns about the whole concept, though, of problematic smartphone use. You know, basically, problematic smartphone use is not really well defined. They have a smartphone addiction scale, but there's no consensus on what the cutoff score is for smartphone use being a problem. Like, it doesn't say if you have a score of five, that's a problem. If you have a score of four, it's not a problem. It's just a scale. Um, And since smartphones are ubiquitous and smartphone use is constant, and a lot of people start when they're kids, it's just hard to know what counts as too much use. You know, various sources say Americans spend four to five hours a day using their smartphones. So what counts as too much? Is the average too much? Is more than the average too much? Who knows? So that's a big limitation. So in terms of the results, the first hypothesis is that FOMO would be positively linked to problematic smartphone use severity, and they did find that in their data. So that was a yes. Second hypothesis is that emotional dysregulation is significantly and positively related to FOMO, and they found that via only one domain, which was poor impulse control. Other domains of emotional dysregulation did not seem to be related to fear of missing out. And finally, third hypothesis is that 
is there a pathway from emotional dysregulation through FOMO to severe problematic smartphone use? And they found some support for this hypothesis via, again, poor impulse control domain, but not the others. So they indicate in general that greater impulse control problems is associated with heightened problematic smartphone use via increased fear of missing out. Whew, that's a mouthful. So will this help me in patient care? I don't think I'm going to be able to apply the findings of this study to my personal practice since while people ask me a lot about smartphone addiction, no one comes to me specifically for treatment of this disorder. I mean, the treatment is psychological. I'm not a psychologist or a therapist. But I did learn a lot as I worked on that episode, and I have a much clearer sense of what might actually be problematic smartphone use. So in that sense, I found it very useful. Impulse control was the component of emotional dysregulation that most connected the fear of missing out. So impulse control training could be a strategy for someone who has both a fear of missing out and issues with their smartphone. So compulsive checking of social media, compulsive fear of disconnection. And if that manifests as doing, you know, spending too much time with your smartphone at the expense of other things, you could work on your impulse control. But again, it's such a new area and problematic smartphone use is poorly defined. So I'm not sure if these conclusions are really ready for prime time. What did you think? I wanted to like this article a lot because I feel like it's such a relevant thing, right? I think that smartphone use. I know my wife saw me reading this the one day and she's like, I hope you finally learn to get off your phone. And um, it's an interesting thought, right? It's an interesting concept where I think we, you're right. We probably need to define it a little bit more. I get that uh, alert every week on my phone telling me how many hours of screen time I had. And it, it does humble me a bit, but I'm not sure you're right. Like what is the, is, what is the dose dependence there? Right. Well, and what's good and what's bad? Like the whole reason I got a smartphone is so that I could take pictures of my kids and share them with my mom. But that's one of the components of fear of missing out, you know, the need to take pictures of your life and share it with other people. But was that bad? Like, does that show that I have FOMO, you know, or that I should not have gotten my smartphone because I shared a lot of pictures with my mom? You know, so it's just not well defined, I don't think. Like the person at the concert with the recording, the person performing with the scratchy thing, not even paying attention, like not even in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Episode 37, uh, superiority and cost effectiveness of monthly extended release buprenorphine versus daily standard of care medication, a pragmatic parallel group, open label, multi-center, randomized controlled phase three trial. This was a really popular one in terms of download. And it actually makes me feel good because this was a really long and dense article. It was like 23 pages and it was a thick 23. I feel like I was like on the heavy bag at the gym on this one. Yeah. And can I, can I just say we all owe you, everyone who listened to that owes you for distilling it for us so that we didn't have to read it. So thank you. Thank you, John. I thought you did read it at Journal Club. Well, I read it, most of it. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so this... <laughs> It's it's a it's a cool trial though. So the study design it's extended release pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder. That's called the Expo study. I love the names of some of these. By the way, Expo is pretty cool. It was a pragmatic parallel group, open label, multi center, superiority, one to one, blocked allocation, randomized controlled phase three trial conducted at five national health service community based treatment clinics in England and Scotland. So that kind of hits like a lot of your points for like a really good study, right? And it was between August 2019 and November 2021, and it compared extended release depot buprenorphine to methadone or sublingual buprenorphine. So either kind of the depot formulation or standard of care is what they called it, either methadone or uh, sublingual buprenorphine for 24 weeks. Um, it was done in people that were 18 and above with moderate to severe opioid use disorder, typically stable on less than 24 or equal to 24 milligrams of buprenorphine a day or less than or equal to 30 milligrams of methadone per day. And I think they, they chose that number so they could roll over, right? All participants were like randomly allocated to one of the two groups, and they were also given a case manager. They call them a clinic key worker uh, in the UK, um, so I thought that was kind of cool as well. And they saw them every fortnight, which was it's 14 days. And I have started to use the word fortnight more since it was used so much in this paper. So the study procedure, they did a baseline face-to-face -face, uh, investigator administered interview. At baseline, they obtained 19 different metrics, kind of an assessment. I can kind of briefly go through them later on, but basically a lot of data capture at baseline. Patients were randomized to receive standard of care or the depot medication. Patients would receive their first 300 milligram injection for the buprenorphine immediately 
at randomization if they were on greater than or equal to eight milligrams of buprenorphine um, after a run-in day of eight milligrams as well as the other way you could do this. So basically they would either do a run-in or if you're on a high enough dose, they would kind of start you kind of immediately. And then they basically gave you the option of continuing a standard 300 second loading dose followed by the 100, 100 monthly injections, which is kind of like considered the, the manufacturer labeling, or they would talk about you could do the 300 with subsequent 300 uh, milligram injections. So if you needed the higher dose, which is also something the manufacturer does allow, they would allow you to roll into that. They did a clinic follow-up every 14 days for 24 weeks. At every visit, they got a UDS and they did a timeline follow back for drug use. Every month, they had a visual analog scale for perceived need and want for opioids and cocaine. That's a vast N and a vast W. At weeks 4, 12, and 24, they administered 11 of those baseline metrics. At weeks 12 and 24, they also added another three additional metrics. Primary outcomes were days of abstinence, and they used kind of UDS validation, but also this timeline follow back, which is basically like a reverse history that was obtained for the patients. Secondary outcomes were treatment retention, opioid use and cocaine use disorder remission, cocaine and benzodiazepine use, longest duration of continuous abstinence from opioids, cocaine, and benzodiazepines. Um, and then they basically looked at these multiple scoring metrics, which was the alcohol use for the ALK FQM, the ADAPT, the CEQF, the VASN, VASW, CGI, OI, the DERS SF, the PROI, the SURE, the QUID SR, the WSAS. So lots of, of questionnaires validating kind of different aspects of recovery addiction. So a, a lot of data points. Yeah, so much data, so much data. Yeah, kind of pros and cons of this study. You know, it was kind of a research grant uh, funded by Indivier, which kind of produces the depot formulation. It was supposed to be kind of one of these scientific grants, kind of non-directly industry funded. So it's supposed to be for like academic pursuit, not for product sales. Several of the authors did have some financial disclosures. The only two that were kind of worth saying is kind of a, a couple of them had Indivier and then Beckley SciTech was another one. Those are more private institutions, but otherwise they're more like academic research type grants. And, and that might as well have been from those as well, like these research grants from industry, but they did kind of announce that. I like the fact that very odd for addiction medicine or kind of like a, a refreshing change, a parallel group, open label, multi-center, superior army, a randomized trial with one-to-one -one randomization, uh, attempted blinding at one point, although it's kind of hard to blind for a, a depot injection versus medications. And I like the fact that they call it like standard conditions. And so basically, these were basically just clinics that they, they did this at. So this is kind of standard operating procedure, just normal clinics. It wasn't some sort of like sterile research environment where the patients were super subselected to come to this massive academic research center. These were just administered at, at clinics around the UK that were just kind of treating patients with opioid use disorder, also polysubstance use disorder. So very real world applicable. What did you think? No, I thought it was really good. I thought it it has all the adjectives, randomized, controlled, you know, randomized, controlled, multi-center, blah, 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 that makes it, I won't say our other work is not legitimate, but it really helps you do a clean clinical question. Um, so no, I thought it was a great article. And it, it asked an easy question, like it was easy to understand, which I really liked. Yeah. And I, I think the one thing that has come up, multiple people have made the statement of, you know, if you, if you basically have a, a value of, of 0 0.005, like for your null hypothesis, right? If you have this many variables, the likelihood that you're going to have some that are positive that may not truly be positive, that does start to, you start rising in your analysis of the article. So kind of interestingly, primary outcomes, the depot extended release buprenorphine demonstrated a statistically significant enhancement compared to standard of care medications in terms of mean days of absence from opioids. Uh, statistically significant subgroup analysis also showed that there was increased duration of patients with more severe opioid use disorder. So it seemed to be more effective in that subgroup that had kind of more severe disease. So not only more effective, but also for people with a higher degree of illness. Secondary outcomes for this uh, basically found that participants on the depot extended release formulation had a longer mean enrollment, so they stayed in treatment longer when they adjusted and did like this covariate analysis for other factors associated with uh, duration of treatment. They showed that it still held true that the depot formulation kind of maintained patients in treatment longer than standard of care. And basically, not surprisingly, 
the secondary uh, outcomes of cocaine use and kind of flush out the show anything there. So buprenorphine, not surprisingly, did not make any difference on cocaine use disorder. Yeah, I was actually talking about that very fact with a resident today about, you know, someone who is still using cocaine while on buprenorphine. This is a sidebar, but I do see this kind of come up a lot about the depot formulation outside of this trial where they kind of have talked about it with cocaine use disorder. I'm not sure where that, that kind of is coming from. Is there like animal literature or something? But I, I feel like that question is asked and I, I don't understand the, the pharmacology for why it would be an effective treatment unless it's coming from somewhere else. Yeah, I, I don't know. I could guess, but I don't have an answer. You're smarter than me. I thought maybe, you know, so safety, not surprising. Um, both the treatment options were very safe. We know that uh, methadone and buprenorphine kind of when administered appropriately without co-prescription are very safe medications. The depot medication as well, very safe medication. Most common side effect, unsurprisingly, is local site reaction from injection. Not an uncommon uh, thing that we see that typically self-resolves without any intervention necessary. Um, in terms of serious outcomes, uh, four patients from each group were treated in the emergency department for unintentional drug poisonings and discharge. So kind of four unintentional overdoses from each, kind of not different between the two groups. Um, one participant from each group did die during the trial period from unrelated causes from their treatment. So just died unrelated to anything that was being done. They did do a cost effectiveness analysis and based upon this very complicated modeling, they thought that actually the medication did not hit the threshold for cost effectiveness, which I thought was interesting for a, an industry funded study. Well, it's really expensive. It is. It could be cost effective if they made it cheaper. Maybe they will. Someday. I mean, it's it's a newer product, right? And, and I, I've heard from the other just kind of recently, I, I heard the whole uh, drama behind the release of the two competing depot products. and. I guess that both were in development. There is a lot of kind of legal back and forth as to when they could be released. And so it sounds like between legal costs and development that there's probably been a significant investment from these companies. Yeah, I'm sure. Sure. All right. We, now we are ready for episode 38 article, which is my favorite of these 10. And this was called Receipt of Opioid Use Disorder Treatments Prior to Fatal Overdose in Comparison to No Treatment in Connecticut from 2016 to 2017. This was published in the journal of Drug and Alcohol Dependence. And in terms of background, there are several treatment options for opioid use disorder, as we know. You can take medication, buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone, or you can do psychosocial assistance. Um, and by that, we mean things like short-term inpatient, which we would call detox, or long-term inpatient that people call rehab, or outpatient therapy groups, or individual counseling. Those are all these sort of psychosocial treatment. Medication has been shown to be effective. It's easier to study medication, and it's been shown to be effective in both clinical trials and real-world pragmatic studies. But evidence for the non-medication treatment is lacking. As I said, it's much harder to study those interventions. And so this paper aimed to provide some modern pragmatic data comparing the risk of death after treatment with medication to treatment without medication for opioid use disorder. So to be specific about the clinical question, this paper included patients with opioid use disorder and everyone who died of an opioid-related cause in 2016-2017 in the state of Connecticut. There were 965 people who died of opioid overdoses during this study, and they estimated through many, many data sources that there were 103,000-plus people with opioid use disorder during that time. And 72,586 of those 100,000-ish people did not receive treatment, so about 72 percent of people did not receive treatment for opioid use disorder. The event they looked at was exposure to the different treatments for opioid use disorder. And if a patient used multiple treatment modalities, the last one prior to death was counted. This study looked at stays in treatment, like inpatient treatment, recorded by the state, both short and long term, which they defined as greater or less than 14 days. And they looked at buprenorphine and methadone. They compared it to no treatment at all, or at least none of those treatments that were listed. The outcome was fatal opioid poisoning and the treatments received in the six-month window prior to that death. So was this a valid trial? I thought it was valid. They did a great job estimating the number of people with opioid use disorder, and I thought it was extremely relevant. There were some weaknesses inherent in it being a retrospective cohort study. They were not able to include non-residential, non-medication-based treatment, which is a huge mainstay of opioid use disorder treatment. So things like mutual support groups, Narcotics Anonymous, individual counseling, outpatient intensive programs, you know, like daily therapy programs. So those were not included. And also they did not include naltrexone, although I think that's less significant. 
And I think there was also pretty big problems with confounding. So different exposure categories had different underlying demographics. So the patients who went to inpatient rehab long term were probably not the same as the patients who were given buprenorphine or the patients who got no treatment at all. We often see patients turning to inpatient treatment more of the last resort when they're really ill. So if people do worse with inpatient treatment, it might be because they're sicker, not because the inpatient treatment is inherently worse. So I think that was a big problem with the data, but it was still a great study. The results were very interesting. So I'm just going to summarize the clinical question one more time so we remember it. It is in patients with a fatal overdose involving opioids, what is the incidence rate and relative risk of exposure to different treatments for opioid use disorder? So first, we have four different types of treatment in this study and the incidence of death after exposure to those treatments per 1,000 patients exposed. So for methadone, we had six deaths per 1,000. For buprenorphine, 6.5 deaths per 1,000. For no treatment, we had 9.8 deaths per 1,000. And for inpatient treatment of any duration, 17.4 deaths per 1,000. So they also calculated the relative risks, if you like the numbers that way. So compared to no treatment at all, methadone and buprenorphine were associated with a reduced risk of death. Relative risk was 0.62 for methadone and 0.66 for buprenorphine. Compared to no treatment at all, inpatient treatment of any duration was associated with a much higher risk of death with a relative risk of 1.77. Compared to methadone, inpatient treatment of any duration was associated with almost a three times higher risk of death with a relative risk of 2.87. So the authors say that this is an unacceptably high probability for treatments that are purported to benefit patients with opiate use disorder and likely to be paid for by public tax revenue. Bottom line, exposure to short and long-term inpatient treatment provided no protection against fatal opioid poisoning. Non-medication treatment might have even been worse than no treatment whatsoever. And then finally, medication treatment, even if it was not continued, so even if it's for short duration, reduced the risk of opioid-related deaths. So basically, is this article going to help me? This article has definitely changed my practice. Um, I'm just going to quote the authors. They say, Population level efforts to reduce opioid overdose deaths need to focus on expanding access to agonist based medication treatments and are unlikely to succeed if access to non medication for opioid use disorder treatment is made more available. So, in conclusion, I really will not be recommending any treatment to my patients that do not include medication for opioid use disorder. Um, I'll support any patient in whatever decision they choose to make for their care because I believe self efficacy is really important in addiction treatment. But if someone asks me what I recommend, I'll say the only thing that's really been shown to reduce the rate of opioid-related death is medication. So this article has definitely changed my practice. How about you, John? Has it made a difference in how you think about inpatient versus outpatient treatment? It, I, it is interesting, right? I feel like medication is backbone, right? So certainly I do have people that go to inpatient treatment. I actually had one that just went yesterday. Although I, I actually, I, I can't tell you the last time I sent someone to inpatient treatment for for opioid use, I feel like it's it's always kind of the other substance is what I think tends to patients tend to elect at this point. But you're right; I would never kind of advocate at this point kind of going to inpatient treatment if you're failing medication and telling you to get off medication and go to an inpatient treatment facility. I think that's just you're going to lose tolerance, you're going to relapse, you're kind of setting someone up for failure. Not that they can't be successful, but I'm kind of giving them a deck of cards that stinks. Yeah, I agree with that. I saw two patients today, both of whom had just finished stays in rehab and both of them were there for alcohol use disorder. The, you know, buprenorphine pretty much was taking care of the opioid use disorder. So they just stayed on that. Yeah. I don't think that forcing people to go to rehab too is a good thing, right? For if you're not doing well in opioid use disorder, I feel like what it really is, is it's practitioner like respite care, right? It's not, it's not really for the patient, right? I feel like a lot of times I'm seeing that done by people. It's, it's, they are tired of the situation and they need a break and that's not right. 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 Agreed. All right. Article 39, effects of abstinence from opioids and neuropsychological performance in men's with opioid use disorder, a longitudinal study. So this is a prospective observational study, only of 50 patients from 18 to 55, meaning DSM-5 criteria for opioid use disorder, evaluating the effect of opioid abstinence on neuropsychological functioning. Um, they basically had an extensive exclusion list from this um, trial. So if you had any other substance use disorder, you had any major mental, neurological, or physical ailment that could complicate assessment of cognitive function and neuropsychiatric function, um, and if you had any component of withdrawal or protracted withdrawal, you were excluded. So this really kind of isolated down to people that were 
truly just assessing the effects of, of a very small set of patients without any comorbid conditions for the effects of abstinence. And abstinence in this trial was either kind of complete abstinence, but actually what it was for most patients was um, oral naltrexone. So they did neuropsych assessments, and they did this at week zero, two, and eight. They did cows and sows just to make sure that also there was no withdrawal confounding interpretation. And they did a bunch of these kind of good old validated uh, testing, the Wisconsin card sort test for executive function, the digital span test forward and backwards for attention and concentration, the recognition test for nonverbal memory, the verbal retention for similar and dissimilar pairs for verbal memory. Um, I like the fact that this was this prospective study, uh, longitudinal in nature. I love the fact that they did kind of narrow because I feel like, you know, neuropsych functioning is so complicated. I think if you were to include all comers and people in various stages of withdrawal, I think it'd be hard to actually tease out what is the effect of the abstinence part of it itself. I thought that the fact that the trial was only eight weeks, I kind of, when I first heard that, I didn't think that'd be a long enough time to see something statistically significant. That's my bias before I read the, the study. And interestingly, this is out of India, and uh, the most common opioid that's used there is actually heroin, like, you know, straight old school heroin, 72% of, of patients, were that was what they were using. So not in the fentanyl era. So kind of apples to oranges, a little bit of what we're currently experiencing. What do you think, Sonia? I thought it was really good. I agree with you about the eight week time frame because other stuff I've read shows brain recovery over a much longer time, like six months or a year. And so it would be great to see that data too. But I, I mean, you know, spoiler alert, the results were awesome. They didn't need more than eight weeks, really. So that's great. Yeah, the results here showed in as little as zero to two weeks, so two weeks of sobriety, there was statistically significant improvement in neuropsych testing for attention, concentration, verbal memory, and nonverbal memory. So only two weeks, two weeks of, of abstinence or naltrexone use, and you already had a statistically significant improvement. I mean, it was modest, but it was statistically significant. Uh, executive function, so higher brain functioning, they actually did have an improvement as well during the trial, but it was delayed to the eight week time frame. So it took up to eight weeks for that. You know, that's when the trial ended. I would have loved to see how these kind of progressed over a longer period of time. I think kind of the, uh, the, the takeaway I take from this is that patients feel hopeless when they come to see you. Like they feel hopeless for so many ways, right? So they got like psychosocial issues. They often have untreated mental health issues. And I think oftentimes they think that they've damage their life, their brain, their health to a point that there is no improvement, right? I think there it's almost like the uh, psychology experiment where the rat would come up and just get cut in the corner of the box. It's just kind of like learned helplessness, right? And I think this kind of at least lets me tell patients that I can't tell you what your life's going to be like when all is said and done, but certainly I know that from a health, physical health, a psychosocial standpoint, and now I can say even from a cognitive standpoint, there's going to be improvement if you continue to treat, prioritize your health and work with us. Only limitation here is that, you know, this was not for medications for opioid use disorder, which is our standard of care. So if I were to kind of look at this for my substitute set of patients on naltrexone or total abstinence as their, their method of choice for not using opioids, it's a relatively uh, smaller percentage of my practice. Right. And I'm hesitant to promote things that might discourage people from using buprenorphine and might encourage abstinence as the best treatment for opioid use disorder because in terms of mortality, that's definitely not the case. But I do think it's important that patients know what they're getting into, you know, in terms of informed consent. It's not We've got to tell people the pros and cons, or at least they need to be aware of how these medications affect their bodies, even if they choose to use buprenorphine and is a better alternative than using illicit drugs. I think they need to know how it can affect them. And that's the only really, you know, sort of moral and fair thing to do when you're treating patients. All right. Congratulations to everybody who's stuck with us so far. So this is article number 40, Drug Overdose Risk with Benzodiazepine Treatment in Young Adults comparative analysis in privately and publicly insured individuals. It was published in the journal Addiction in 2023. So benzodiazepines are highly habit-forming medications after even relatively short use. And they're also a very common drug implicated in overdose deaths, especially when combined with opioids. And in the U.S., we have a black box warning regarding co-prescription of those two medications. However, even though we have knowledge of the risks, benzodiazepines continue to be prescribed frequently. Patients request them and clinicians are eager to comply. So while there is an overdose risk in those who take benzodiazepines non-medically, who abuse them, 
take them with illicit opioids. Little is known about the overdose risk of taking the medication initially, especially for young people and people who are kind of not involved in illicit use who are taking them as prescribed. So that's what this study looked at. The clinical question is about whether a new prescription of benzodiazepine or a benzodiazepine plus an SSRI is associated with more drug poisonings than a prescription for SSRI alone in young people who are being newly treated for anxiety or depression. And this was one of those big prospective cohort studies from a giant insurance database looking at prescribing and diagnosis data. So there were 700,000 plus people in this study, both privately and publicly insured from all over the U.S., And it was people under age 30, age 18 to 30, who had insurance and they had depression or anxiety, and they either got an SSRI, a benzodiazepine, or a combination of the two. It excluded people with seizure disorder or who couldn't take any of the study medications. And what it looked at was whether drug overdose events was the first outcome and drug overdose intent, i.e. was it a suicide versus an unintentional overdose? And was the overdose related to benzodiazepines or other drugs? So they really looked at overdoses and poisonings after you started one of these three types of medication, either benzodiazepine, SSRI, or a combo. And again, these are not fatal overdoses. These are drug overdose events that were treated in the ED or in the hospital. So a fatal overdose was only counted if the patient was brought into the emergency room. So someone who died in the field would not necessarily have been counted in this study. It's not a study of mortality. We thought it was a pretty good trial with its huge size. And the authors tried really hard to control for all the confounders. But honestly, like a lot of our other studies, you just can't say that the patients who receive benzodiazepines are the same as the patients who received SSRIs at baseline. So if there's a difference in outcome, it's hard to be sure that it's due just from the medication. You know, you could say that people who have a history of substance use disorder and have a higher overdose risk might seek out benzodiazepines. They might request those as their physicians or feel like those are the meds that work best for them and they'd be more likely to get those prescriptions. Um, Or they might have more severe mental health problems and their prescribers want to give them something they view as stronger or more effective. So it's just hard to say the groups were similar at baseline. That's a big limitation. But overall, I still think it was great because you certainly can't do a randomized controlled trial of this question. So the results, basically, among young adults initiating benzodiazepines for anxiety or depression alone or with an SSRI, that is associated with an increased risk of medically treated drug overdose compared to SSRI alone. They observed that association, that primary outcome, in publicly and privately insured individuals and in all pre-specified subgroups. So the association was consistent across all groups in this study. It was strongest, sadly, in a group of intentional overdoses that you know we would call suicide attempts. And there was a strong association between receiving a prescription for a benzodiazepine and having opioid use disorder, as well as receiving a prescription opioid. So there was just like a mountain of data in this study. And I don't want to read it all off, but I'm going to give just a few data points. You know, the study was divided into publicly and privately insured patients. So in terms of people with private insurance, when comparing a benzodiazepine to an SSRI, the risk of subsequent drug overdose was 0.9% with the benzodiazepine. And 0.67% with the SSRI, so much higher with the benzodiazepine. The hazard ratio was 1.35. If you compare the combo, benzo plus SSRI to an SSRI alone, the overdose risk was 1.26% compared to 0.65% with a hazard ratio of 1.99. So including the benzodiazepine really almost doubled the overdose risk. And you saw the same among the publicly insured patients. You know, again, the hazard ratio almost doubled when you added a benzodiazepine to an SSRI um, compared to an SSRI alone when treating anxiety and depression. So there was just a ton more data in this paper if you're interested, but that was the main conclusion. So will I use this in patient care? You know, no, because I don't prescribe benzodiazepines for anxiety and depression, at least not off the bat. The only time I prescribe benzodiazepines is for patients who are kind of prescribe them chronically. And I feel that after, you know, many decades of benzodiazepine exposure, the patient was going to be worse if I stop it than if I continue it. But I never initiate benzodiazepine treatment, except in extremely limited situations, like you're going for an MRI and you have severe claustrophobia, or you need like one pill for a long airplane flight or something. But bottom line, this study, you know, reaffirmed that that's the right choice. It basically, the risk existed. It wasn't huge. So I don't have to worry too much about, you know, killing my patients if they are on benzodiazepines, but 
it definitely supported me not starting them. How about you? Do you think this paper will change how you prescribe the benzodiazepines? I think when we had this at the Journal Club, I was kind of devil's advocate here. I, I feel like I prescribe more benzos than I wish I did. Um, and I don't prescribe a ton, but I thought I would never have any patients on these, to be quite frank, when I came out of residency and, and you inherit people on them. And then sometimes it's just hard. People have just such terrible lives that, you know, you can throw a lot at them and they just still are depressed and anxious all the time. So sometimes I've kind of caved there. But you're right. I, I do do extensive counseling before starting the medications. And in my older patients on them, I, I don't do forced tapers, but we do discuss on a yearly basis kind of concerns regarding falls, cognitive impairment as they age. And, you know, those are typically relatively patient centric outcomes that they do care about. And, and sometimes they'll want a reduction or to change around. Or sometimes when they hear like, hey, my friend has a Xanax. Can, uh, can you give that to me too? And I'm like, well, you're 72 years old. Here's the risk. And then when they hear all that stuff, like, oh, never mind. Right. So I don't know. There's informed consent here, but I, I certainly don't love prescribing them. And I find a very small niche where they, that truly benefit from them, to be quite frank. Well, and again, the data in this study showed that there is a higher risk, but to add a benzodiazepine, you know, to an SSRI, you would have to do add a benzodiazepine onto 164 people before you caused one unintentional poisoning. So it's not like it hurts every patient. You know, one in 164 is the number needed to harm for a drug overdose for our privately insured patients. So, you know. I don't have 164. Well, there you go. Maybe maybe have a quarter, quarter of a person. Statistics says you're doing fine then. Maybe. <laughs> That's how statistics work. <laughs> Ooh, well, that was a whirlwind. Thank you, John. I hope all of our listeners will message us on social media or email us about which was their favorite of these 10 articles. We'll take a poll and we'll see whose article comes out on top. Thank you for listening to the Addiction Medicine Journal Club. The best part of the Journal Club is the conversation and we want to hear what you have to say. To have your opinions about the articles included in a future episode, send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, email, or join us on our Facebook group. The links are in the show notes. Original theme music was composed and performed by Benjamin Kennedy, audio editing by Aaron McHugh, CME support from MyCares, produced by Dr. Patrick Beeman and Ars Lanka Media. Addiction Medicine Journal Club is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. The views expressed here are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of our employers or the authors of the articles we review. All patient information has been modified to protect their identities. Thank you for being the part of the conversation and have a great day. Thank you.